the morning is a uh, revolution and I will talk about the digital revolution and it's great that uh, there will be no uh, digital devices uh, for presentation yeah so those are part of the revolution uh, yeah um, my topic is not only to talk about the digital revolution uh, I would like to look back into the history to learn more about revolutions in the music uh, industry uh, and I would like to ask the question and to answer the question where does the revolution comes from what are the drivers of a revolution uh, and if we look at the current situation in the music industry we can see okay we have degrees in production costs music is produced by laptops on the computer uh, not in a sound studio, which was very, very expensive in the former times. Uh, the manufacturing is, uh, manufacturing costs uh, are decreasing because a digital file does not cost uh, the world. Uh, and uh, yeah, think about record, think about CD pressing, this is a very costly matter. We have a disintermediation. This, this means uh, you can directly connect as an artist uh, with the audience uh, and, and you do not need a, a physical distribution network or something like that. Uh, also part of this revolution is that we can uh, cherry pick music uh, now in the former times when I was young, yeah, this is the former times. Uh, in these former times uh, we had to buy the album. You know, there was one song on the album, this was great, but you had to buy the whole album, oh gosh. Uh, but now you go on the internet to Amazon, uh, to a streaming service, whatever, and you click a button and say, okay, that's my song. Yeah? So uh, the market is different now. It is not an album market, it is a single market. Again, as in the 1960s. Uh, we also have a different consumption uh, pattern now. That means uh, we are accessing music. Think about Spotify, think about YouTube, about different streaming services. Uh, not ownership is anymore the main uh, business model in the music industry. And we have the possibility also for artists of direct marketing uh, by social media. So what changed in the digital revolution? Uh, in the former times, the record was in the center of the value-added uh, network in the music industry. All revenue streams came from uh, the record. Also, the life sector was dependent uh, on the record. It was a kind of promotion tool for, for touring artists. Uh, but now, the artist moved um, in the center of the value-added network, and all uh, revenue streams depend now on the artists. Uh, but, as I promised, I would like to ask the question, or put the question, what are the drivers of such a revolution? And it helps to look back into the history of the music industry uh, to the 20th century, back to the 20th century, uh, and we can identify that there was not only just this digital revolution, the current digital revolution, we also had uh, a, a revolution in the music industry in the 1920s and also in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1920s, the jazz revolution, and in the 50s, the rock and roll revolution. revolution. And I would like to explain uh, something more later on both revolutions, because we can learn uh, from these revolutions to understand the current situation now. So, uh, this is the business cycle of the music industry, not the global music industry, but uh, the US music industry, because we have the numbers and we have always US dollars uh, and therefore it's possible to show the business cycle from really early times when the Shellac 
uh, was uh, distributed, and uh, later with music cassettes and vinyl records and all these digital formats. Yeah, so we have the possibility to compare. So we also can see that revolutions has something to do with the market. We have. Uh, sales declines when a revolutions hit an industry, not only the music industry, uh, and we can see it here. If we look closer, we can see this was really tremendous. We can see it here in the 50s, and we can see it here. Okay, this is clear. Yeah, this is a sales decline, uh, and it's not not that good for the music industry or for the for the record labels. Uh, so let's start uh, with the first first revolution in the music industry. I call it the jazz revolution. Um, and I start with the sales decline. In 1921, the whole US uh, recorded music market had a volume of 106 million US dollars. And this volume was demolished, more or less, uh, in, uh, what is this here? 1933, we had just six million for the whole U.S. market. Imagine that. So 93% of the recorded music market was destroyed by this revolution. You can say, okay, uh, this was the year 1929, the Black Friday and the Deep Depression. That's true. But if you look closer, you can see the recession started uh, immediately after 1921. Uh, the sales decreased from 106 uh, million to 75 million in 1928. And so we have to ask the question, why? What happened in, in this uh, period? And uh, we can see that different forces are the drivers of such a revolution. In the special case of the 1920s, uh, we have commercial radio. The first radio station, the first commercial radio station, opened uh, or started to broadcasting uh, in, on the 2nd November 1920. K, uh, KDKA Pittsburgh was the first uh, broadcasting station in the US, but also worldwide. Uh, and broadcasting revolutionized uh, the music industry because music was for free now. Yeah? And it was supported, it was financed by advertisement. And the first reaction of the record companies was, we have to destroy the broadcasting companies. We have to fight against them. They are the enemies. But we will see later that this was uh, the wrong decision. Uh, because uh, the sales declined further, and it is interesting that uh, the record companies did not accept a new technology. This was electrical recording. Before electrical recording, as with microphones, there was acoustical recording. So there was this kind of, of gramophone, you know it, eh? And you have to sing and to have to, to play in the in the in the uh, uh, in this in this gramophone, yeah. A whole, a whole orchestra was recorded by such a device. Imagine that, yeah? Operas, incredible. Uh, and so then was uh, electrical recording, and you might think, okay, this is, this is wonderful for the record labels. Yeah? They say, oh, okay, bring us that. No, they said, no, we oppose that. We don't want that. We do not want that, because it, it looks like radio, and we hate radio, yeah? And they also, also said to their, uh, collecting society, the ASCAP in the United States, don't license music to the, rec uh, to, the, to, the, to the broadcasting stations. Don't do that. So the broadcasting stations, the bit net networks, established their own collecting society, the BMI. Uh, and so the uh, revolution went on and uh, the record companies became weaker and weaker, economically uh, turned down. And the red networks, despite the deep depression, became larger and larger and much more powerful than before. And at the end, the record labels, the majors, Victor Talking Machine, Columbia, Phonograph, were bought 
by the broadcasting networks. In 1929, the Radio Corporation of America, the RCE, bought Wick the Talking Machine. Some years later, Columbia Phonograph was bought by CBS, Columbia Broadcasting Systems. And the broadcasting uh, companies subordinated uh, the record labels to their logics. So this was only a side business. To sell records was only a, a side business uh, for the big broadcasting networks in the US. And so uh, also, uh, not, the, not only the economically and the, the technology, technological uh, environment changed, but also the aesthetic, the musical environment changed. Because uh, until the 1920s, the repertoire was the so-called Tin Pan Alley repertoire. As a music that was, 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 was played uh, in, uh, on Broadway, in Broadway shows. And uh, the interpreters like Al Chosen were very famous. And uh, after the 20s, in the 30s, uh, the, the main music style was swing. This is a kind of elaborated jazz music. It was a dance music style that was very, very popular. But the large record labels also opposed jazz because jazz was played on radio. And we do not like jazz. Also for racist motives because jazz is the music of the Afro-Americans in, in the United States. And only small record labels, OK Records, Paramount Records and so on, uh, they supported jazz, they recorded jazz. And in the swing era, jazz was transformed to the mainstream music, not just in the USA, but later also worldwide. And jazz was the perfect music uh, for broadcasting. They make, made tests how a jazz orchestra, for example, by Benny Goodman, uh, sounds uh, best uh, with three trombones, uh, three trumpets, a rhythm group, and so on and so on. So this was uh, the jazz revolution. That's why I call it the jazz uh, revolution. Uh, and there was another uh, development uh, apart from broadcasting, uh, but uh, in relation to the electrical recording technology, this was the film, the sound film, the talkies. The first talkie was uh, initially a silent movie that was transformed by Warner Bros. Uh, studios to a talkie because they licensed the new uh, recording uh, technology and it was uh, the jazz singer and the main character was Al Chosen, a Broadway star. And uh, it shows us that not just the broadcasting industry became important for the music industry, but also the film industry, the movie industry, because they acquired all uh, music, music publishing houses in the US, because they did not want to pay for the licensing, licenses. Uh, uh, for, for, for the music. So uh, we have uh, actors from outside the music industry that became uh, the center of the new, as I call it, uh, paradigm. So let's move to the 1950s. We know this is the era of rock and roll, Elvis Presley and others. And it's an interesting fact that after the Second World War, there was uh, no expansion of the market. There was no uh, boom of the record market. You might think about it. Yeah, the war is over, so let's, let's uh, buy records again. No, it was a decline, as you can uh, see it here. And so we also have to ask the question why there was a decline. Uh, and we also can identify different aspects of this call it the rock and roll revolution. We have uh, the baby, baby boomer generation in the US now. Yeah? They are back from the, uh, so the parents are back from the war and they, they need 
new music now. There is a need for new music. Not that old stuff swing. Come on, forget it. We do not like that swing. Yeah, uh, killed Hugh Wellington. We don't want him. So we want new music. Yes, we want something special. And uh, the youth in the U.S. Uh, they discovered rhythm and blues, for example. Yeah. Uh, but also, in a different way, also the so-called hillbilly, also those idiots beyond the mountains, yeah, hillbilly, uh, country and western it is called now, uh, was also very popular. But, and that's interesting, this kind of music, rhythm and blues and country music, was not recorded by the major record labels, owned by the major networks, ABC, NBC, uh, RCA and so on. So that was a market, but uh, the majors were not interested in that market because they said, okay, this is rhythm and blues, this is music for the blacks. We do not like music for the blacks. We do music for the, for the, for the middle class, for the white middle class. They have the money. So indie record labels stepped in the market and they produced rhythm and blues and they produced uh, country and Western, but they had a problem. They had no promotion tool for their music because the large networks were not interested in uh, broadcasting this kind of music, rhythm and blues and country. So there was a very important decision now in 1947 by the Federal Communications Commission responsible for licensing broadcasting stations in the US. And uh, until that year, uh, in each market, as in each state, only three up to five uh, licenses were given to the large networks. But with, with, with FM radio, uh, there was the possibility uh, to establish small uh, broadcasting stations on a local base. And so, uh, the licensing policy was uh, liberalized and hundreds of, of uh, small, uh, underfinanced, undercapitalized uh, <coughs> uh, broadcasting stations were established around the entire uh, United States. Uh, but they had a problem. They had no repertoire because neither BMI nor ASCAP uh, wanted to uh, license their music to them. And they had no possibility to play the records of the major record labels because, okay, you are the enemy. You do not get our music. We do not license our, our uh, records to you. But at the same time, there were the indie record labels with the rhythm and blues and the country repertoire. And they needed the promotion platforms of the small radio stations. And there was a technological uh, invention, a very important one for this development. This was vinyl record. It was, was invented by the majors, by uh, Columbia and by RCA, but uh, vinyl is more or less unbreakable. If you, if you, if you uh, take a shellac and it, it, and, and it it breaks immediately if you make something wrong. Huh? But with vinyl, it was, was easy to distribute it uh, from the small record labels to the small uh, radio stations. And the, the, the distribution costs uh, sunk dramatically in these times. So we have a symbiosis now of uh, FM radio and independent uh, record labels. Uh, and uh, the record labels uh, had a fierce competition among each other because uh, they have to distinguish from themselves. Yeah? We had now, uh, instead of five or six record labels in the US, we had now more than 150. And uh, so they, they started to experiment. Yeah? So they, they started to amalgate country and western with rhythm and blues. Think about, or think of Bill Haley. Rock around the clock. This is a typical way to amalgate this. Or think about uh, Sun Records. Sam Phillips, the owner of Sun Records, he asked a, a young white truck driver with a black voice uh, to record. For one year, uh, he made test records. 
And then the first record of, of Elvis Presley went out. Yeah? This was also experimenting. Or think about the electrification of blues. All the, so most of the black, the Afro-American musicians uh, went from the south to the north because there was was uh, there were, were jobs, yeah, and there were, were ra and there was racism in the south, and it was better in the north, and also the musicians went north uh, with their acoustic guitars, but now the electrical guitar was invented, and one independent label, jazz records, not jazz, the music style, but jazz, yeah, to play jazz. Uh, they uh, electrified the blues, Muddy Waters, for example, and others. So we have also uh, aesthetical innovations that drive uh, the revolution in the music industry. And uh, the result of all this experimentation was rock and roll. And that's why I call it the rock and roll revolution. Okay. Rock and roll is over in the late 1950s as a, as a music genre, as a style. But it was it fueled the whole rock business in the 1960s with the Beatles, with the Rolling Stones. Uh, they they referred to as American artists, and they come from the United Kingdom uh, to the U.S. as the so-called British invasion, as the U.S. Uh, companies called it. So this was the second revolution uh, in the music industry. So you might ask, what happened here? This is not the revolution, as you see. The revolution is here. So what happened here? Uh, so I am able to, uh, to went back <laughs> because uh, yeah, I, 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 can, I can remember what, what, what happened here. Uh, in the late 70s, the main music style was disco. Yeah? You might know Saturday Night Fever, yeah? this famous film. Uh, it's interesting that uh, disco music was not invented by the, by the majors, as you might believe. No, it was invented by the indies. Yeah? And it was later adopted uh, by the majors because it was a wonderful business model. Also, hard rock and heavy metal was also not invited by the, by the majors or by the indies. Yeah? Uh, so the, the, the 60s and the 70s is a, is a, is a, is a very innovative uh, period for new music styles. Hip-hop also appeared in the late uh, 70s. Punk rock uh, appeared in the late uh, 70s. Also electronic music appeared in, in, in these times. Yeah? Uh, so we have now the disco craze. This is the disco craze, you see. Yeah? This, the market was fueled uh, with disco music, but exactly uh, in in springtime of 1980, the uh, the disco craze was over. Yeah, they burned disco record disco records in the U.S. because the youth hated disco in the 80s. So the sales declined, and uh, all innovations on the musical fields uh, were made. There was, there was, I call it a kind of creative crisis in the music industry. And the majors answered this crisis with the superstar business. Huh? Michael Jackson appeared on the scene as a solo artist before he was a part of the Jackson Five, yeah? the small boy, little Michael. Yeah? But now he is an adult and now the second career started. Uh, there was Prince. Madonna, Bruce Springsteen, you name it. So they said, okay, we do not want to segment the market uh, as the Indies did, because the Indies are specialized in different fields on, on uh, punk rock or on hip hop or whatever. Yeah? Uh, they wanted one business model, and this was superstar pop. Yeah? And uh, also another invention helped uh, music television, MTV. It's also in the in the early 1980s. Uh, but the main saver of the music industry in these times was not the music. It was the CD. The CD was introduced in the market in 1982 by Philips and Sony. Philips was in the music industry with Polygram, the largest record label in these times. Uh, and Sony was, in that times, not in the music business. 
but uh, with the Walkman, very interested uh, in the music and with the CD, uh, the whole the whole sales increased. So this was this was the the, the paradise for the music industry. Yeah. So this this boom uh, was fueled uh, by the CD sales because we all had to uh, rebuy the the whole uh, uh, the music archive. Yeah. We had in vinyl, now we had to buy it in CD. Yeah? Uh, so it was just a question of time when uh, this uh, came to an end. Yeah? And as we know, or we might know, it came to an end uh, with, uh, yeah, with a college dropout. Yeah? This was the end. Uh, Sean Fanning. Sean Fanning was a computer nerd, a hacker from the hacker community, and he used his hacker name, Napster, to establish a new system file sharing. Yeah? And this was, this was elegant, because uh, music was digitized in the form of CD, but the record labels did not realize that this was the revolution now. Yeah? They thought, okay, the CD, yeah, higher, uh, higher capacity, storage capacity, that's great, yeah? more than vinyl. But they do not realize that it's digital. And it's only a question how to get this music, this digital music, uh, from this uh, carrier. Uh, and the next step was to say, okay, we have the internet now. This is a computer network. So the easiest way is to say, okay, you have music on your computer, what I like, Okay, let's allow me to take this music and I give you my music. This is the, the concept of sharing, of file sharing. So, the reaction of the music industry was, we do not like that. Because music is for free. We want to earn money with music, to sell music, to sell a physical product, the record. And so, the music industry fought against Napster and then against other file sharing uh, services and even against, until now in Germany and other countries, against individual file sharers. Yeah? Uh, and as you see, revolutions are not really, uh, you cannot stop it. It is unstoppable, we know it now. Uh, we cannot stop it. So. Uh, yeah, the next step was uh, Apple with the download store. Yeah, this was the legal way to acquire uh, music in a digital way, and in, in in a short period of time, Apple with iTunes with the iTunes store conquered the market. In the U.S., 80% of all download sales are made. Uh, on, on the iTunes store. This is really, really powerful. Uh, yeah, and then the development went on, as we know now. We have music streaming now. We have uh, different forms of uh, cloud computing, cloud solutions uh, to access music. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is, as I said before, a change from owning music to accessing and experiencing music. So we are in the midst uh, of the revolution. And uh, so let me ask, or let me show you the ingredients of a revolution in such an industry as the music industry is. Uh, if we compare all these revolutions, we can see the driver of the revolutions is outside creativity. So from outside the music industry, because there is a new thinking, a new acting. Yeah? We had it with broadcasting and the movie business here. We had it with independent uh, record labels uh, and uh, independent FM radio stations here. And we have it here now with Apple, Google, Amazon, you name it. Yes? Also we have a different way to think and to act. It is a kind of creative revolution too. Uh, we also have Napster and now Spotify. So, in this amalgam of, of different uh, 
developments. The whole value network uh, collapse. Or the collapses. This, this means uh, we have now different possibilities to interact. And the result is chaos for the whole industry. And no one likes chaos. Yeah? Maybe theor theoretics on chaos theory, maybe, but uh, yeah. Because chaos increases uncertainty. And we do not like uncertainty. Uh, and uh, this is also a period of destruction. Yeah, you see it. This is this is destruction. Yeah, so the sales went down dramatically, uh, but with a high level of creativity and innovation. And this creativity innovation comes from outside the music industry, from other players that became now in the center of uh, the music industry. And how does the established players respond? The large record companies, but also the indies? Uh, the first step is ignorance. In the 1990s, uh, the internet was, was still there. But internet, what, what's internet? We do not need that. Yeah? Uh, we, we cannot use that. It's, it's made, made no sense for us. Yeah? A digital distribution? Come on, we are selling records. Yeah? So there was poor ignorance in the 1990s uh, towards uh, the internet and the digital possibilities. The next step is, if you cannot ign ignore something, you play down the relevance and say, oh, okay, yeah, this is now, it's, this is now on the screen, yeah, it's, it's wonderful, but for our business model, this makes no sense, yeah? We are, come on, we are, we, are, we are producing records. We do, not, we do not need the digital uh, stuff. But if this does not work to play it down, the next step is to fight against it. Yeah? And then there was the fight. There were the lawsuits against file sharing networks and against individual uh, file sharing. And in the, in the only, only very, very late is an acceptance and a redefinition of the rules for the whole business. But the redefinition is not made by the traditional players. The redefinition is made by the outside players. Think about the market power of Apple in the music industry. They write the rules now uh, for the music uh, business. But please uh, think further. The music industry is just the canary in the mine. Yeah? Let's see it if it's alive. Yeah? in the digital revolution. Uh, so we can study uh, the digital revolution uh, with the help of the music industry to understand the whole uh, industrial revolution. It's, it's really a, a large industrial revolution now uh, that reaches far beyond the music industry and far beyond uh, even the entertainment and media industry. I think the next step is the Internet of Things. And uh, those uh, manufacturers of material products, they have to think about uh, when they will be affected uh, by the digital revolution. And if they have an answer for the digital revolution, and if we uh, look back from the year 20, uh, 2025 to this year, yeah, we can say, okay, this was so tremendous, so a tremendous change. We, we could not imagine in, in, in 2015 what happened? Yeah? Because we are in the midst of a revolution now. So welcome to the revolution and thank you for your attention.